this week of preparing a sermon to start in the book of Joel. I know that that's next. I, I know the order of the Bible. I didn't, I didn't accidentally go from Hosea all the way to the New Testament. I know we said we were going through the minor prophets. I uh, had the intention of doing that, was preparing for that. And this text just sort of came to me, and this is my reason for taking a, just a deviation to the, uh, Galatians chapter 2. Um, it is, for some reason, I just felt as though the Lord uh, wanted me to preach this text, and so I'm going to try to follow that leading. We're only going to be looking at just a couple of verses. If you look in <clears throat> excuse me, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 and 21. Those two verses we're going to unpack this morning for our sermon. And for our public reading, in Galatians 2, starting in verse, uh, well, I'll start a little bit before that. I'll start in verse 15. So if you would please stand. Hopefully you've made it there. Uh, Galatians 2, starting in verse 15. We're going to read down through verse 21. The Word of God says, we ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law, so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I come before you and I pray in Jesus' name that you would help me preach this overwhelming truth, this amazing reality that we as believers have been crucified with Christ and nevertheless we live because Christ lives in us. I pray that we would understand a in a greater way, in a deeper way, the, the awesomeness of your grace to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. As I just prayed, it's going to be very difficult to preach this text because it is so full. And I, I'm trying to be very careful as well. This is some of the, sometimes the difficulty of preaching is you're trying to preach about great things, deep things, and you want everyone to be able to understand it. And at the same time, you don't want to preach it in a way that is wrong or half true or half false. I think the biggest burden on my shoulders this morning is this week I've been kind of dancing around this text and it has impressed upon me a depth that I haven't seen in a very long time. And I don't know how to quite get that across to you. Um, as it is, Paul said so long ago in the book of Corinthians, he said the gospel comes to us sometimes in words and, and, and in weakness. The weakness of man preaches, but the power of God is shown through that. And so I hope that that will happen this morning. When I was a college student, um, very new Christian, we would listen to sermons sometimes, me and my roommates. There was something going on and we didn't do what normal college students did, we listened to sermons. Uh, God was definitely working in our lives, and um, we listened to a sermon by Paris Reedhead and several by Leonard Ravenhill and Paul Washer and others, and we paused the sermon one day, and I was just chilling with my friends in, in uh, his, his room, and I said to him, um, you know, there's two extremes that kind of happen in the Christian life. Some people take the grace of God, and then they swing all the way to the left and they live as though there is no law of God, right? That's called antinomianism. And if you got a, one of your sermon notes, that word is describing this. No law. Anti-namas. That's what it means. Some Christians say, well, I'm forgiven by the grace of God and I'll never be condemned for any of my sins. And praise the Lord, that is true. And so they live however they want to live. 
Um, they just and they chase all kinds of sin and do whatever they want to do, and they're cool with it. That's antinomianism. Then there's the other side of the pendulum swinging, who believe they, they're, they're Christians and they want to live the Christian life, and they're so really set on holiness that they're doing everything that they can by their own power to obey God's law because it makes them feel as though they're right with God. That's called legalism. Now, I remember telling my friends, I said, I, I think if I were going to err on either one of those sides, I would err on the legalistic side. And, you know, I was saying that kind of thinking very, you know, good of myself and you know, we want to be holy people. I would rather err on legalism because I'm going in the right direction. I'm a legalist at heart. But you know what the problem with that statement is? Is this. Both extremes, if you want to call it that, end in hell. Both are not to do with the gospel. Because the law is not of faith. Paul says, here I was thinking in wrong terms. I was thinking that the grace of God is somewhere in the middle between living without his law or looking at his law for justification. And I didn't understand that the answer to that question is no, the grace of God is not even in the same playing field. It's not even in the same ballpark. And I want to spend some time this morning, especially before we go through Joel or any of the other minor prophets, talking to you about something that we need to get because there's a temptation when we go and reread these prophets and you know what it is? We have a t we, there's a temptation to slip back into law thinking, to slip back into thinking that we're made right with God because of what we do. And I want to guard against that. And so I want to spend some time talking to you about the power of the gospel, specifically the power of sanctification. How do we live holy lives? What does it look like to live a holy life? Do we pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps? Do we do this with our own power and our own strength? No. We certainly don't want to be legalists. There's plenty of those in hell because they thought they could get right with God by what they do. There's plenty of people in hell that thought that the law of God was just able to be thrown aside as though his ways are not important. So what do we do? Is there a middle ground? Should we even be thinking in terms of middle ground? I think this text answers that question. You see, background here. Paul had established a church here. He's writing to a church in Galatia. And some people had come to this little town, this little area, and had said, hey, you believe the gospel, but here's, there's one more thing that you need in order to be really right, to be super spiritual, to be super spiritual and to be, make sure that you're right with God. And it's this, believe the gospel and be circumcised. Circumcision, which was part of the Old Testament law. You remember this? Yes. But the message that they, these false teachers were proclaiming was this, you need gospel and you need gospel and. And let me tell you, Paul was mad. There's like two places in the New Testament where you really get to see where Paul is angry. This book is one of them. The other one is in 1 Corinthians. Basically, he says to them, hey, I'm coming to visit you. And when I come there, what do you think? Should I come in like love and meekness or bring a whip to beat you down with, basically? He was so upset with them because of the way that they were walking. In the book of Galatians, it doesn't start like any other book. He says his introduction, and then the first thing he basically says to them in verse 6, he goes, I am astonished you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and turning to a different gospel. He is livid. It's because people were coming to them and they were proclaiming, you need gospel and... And you and I, we need to be very careful that we don't listen to that type of stuff. So let me explain. Let me go into my points then. The power to live the Christian life, the power to overcome sin, even, even after becoming a Christian and being right with God, the power to overcome sin is found in believing the gospel 
by faith. One of the temptations that these people in Galatia were having was this. Well, I started my Christian life. I believed the gospel. But now how am I going to get holy? How am I going to live holy lives? How, how are we going to live and walk with God? They made the wrong assumption by saying, okay, we started by faith, but we need to continue with what? Works. We started, we got into this, involved with this Christian life by trusting Christ. Now the rest of my life, what's it about? Really buckling down and doing this so I can live. And Paul is saying, what? What are you doing? The power of the Christian life is from faith from the very beginning all the way to the end. The power to overcome any particular sin in your life is not by working it out. It's by faith. So let's, let's, let's look at the verse that actually gets to this. It's verse 20. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. There it is. And that's something I want you to hear this morning. When you're fighting, you're a believer, you're fighting against sin, you need to know that verse by heart and you need to know the reality of it in your life because that's where the power comes from. I have been crucified with Christ. Failing to check all the boxes can drive someone mad, can't it? You ever make a list? Right? At about 6 a.m.? You ever make a list at about 6 a.m.? When you're sitting down to pray or something or do your Bible study and the list turns out to be about this long? Come on. I know we got teachers in the room. All right? If you have kids, you, you, there's like no point in making a list, right? You're not going to keep it anyway. Failing to keep a list and to check all the boxes can drive someone mad. I, um, I've tried to do this here recently in my life and uh, every list, I, I don't know if I've actually completed the list that I've made for myself once in my life. And it makes you upset. It makes you angry. And sometimes I've even been told by my former pastor, Michael, you need to lower your expectations. You know why? Because you'll never be disappointed. And I was like, actually, that's pretty good wisdom there. And some people think that the gospel has lowered God's expectations. And that is not right thinking. You see, God, has given, God gave the law to the people in the Old Testament and said, do this and live. The problem was the list was so long. And they got very frustrated. Martin Luther understood this very well. He felt that inside of his heart when he would go to the confessional boxes when he was in the Catholic Church and he would confess for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, three hours, six hours, confessing to a priest until the priest finally broke down and said, Luther, leave this place now and go do something bad, then come back and tell me. They were so sick of listening to him. But you see, he understood something. He understood every little bit of his sin in his heart that comes out of his mouth in the way he treated people. And it was almost drove Martin Luther insane. And it's frustrating to try to keep the law. Do this and live when the list is huge. And God hasn't lowered his expectations. So how are we going to be right with God? How are we going to live if we can't even begin to do his law? We break it the moment we wake up. Even with this one command, are you ready? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Have any of you ever done that for one day or ten minutes? I can't say that I have. But God hasn't lowered his expectations. Here's the beauty of the gospel. He has fulfilled every commandment in the person of his, of his son already. Jesus lived that life that you and I could never, ever live. And the people in Galatia are being taught, you need, the, you need that gospel and something extra. And Paul is saying, you don't need the gospel and, you need the gospel only. We're tempted though. We've trusted in Christ. We've believed the gospel and we have been forgiven. But here's the deal. 
When sin happens in your life, which I know it's happened, just look at yourself this week. What did you do when you sinned? What did you do after? If you're anything, if you're anything like me, you were tempted to try to either fix it. Some of you are, are like me. You like to fix the problem the moment it comes around. What can I do to never do this again? Or you tend to, some of you struggle, you're very sensitive in the heart, and you tend to grovel about, tend to heap up guilt on yourself until you feel bad enough so that you can move on, almost like an internal asceticism, where you beat yourself down. I've done it again. I really need to. And you begin whipping yourself on the back. We are attempt, we're, we're tempted, aren't we, when we sin, to try to sanctify ourselves we think that we're at the helm that we're steering this boat we think god takes care of declaring us right and forgiving us but we've got to take care of the rest by the way this is mormonism but it's also creeping in did you know this is what one of the reasons why um i hate to say it but and i think i've said it before but it's true they say that baptists are the farm team for mormons because we are easily caught into Mormonism. That's because a lot of Baptist preachers somewhat preach this way. That you're saved at the beginning by God, but then the rest of your life you better get to work on your own steam. That is not gospel living. That is not gospel living. Jesus doesn't simply open the door and you walk through it. That is not gospel. You would never walk through, and neither would I, on our own steam. We think about this in terms of faith and works. We say faith is necessary alone for salvation, but works are necessary for sanctification. That's what I've got to do. And so we try to pick ourselves up by our own bootstraps. And we err, and we get frustrated of trying to check those boxes again. The power to overcome sin, brothers and sisters, is found in this verse. I have been crucified with Christ. With him. And so what you and I need to do in our Christian walk when we're fighting against sin is we need to look back to the cross. And what do you see when you look back into the cross? Look to the cross. What do you see there? Who do you see there? Christ, yes, and who else? Take a journey with me, if you will. Look at the cross. See the Son of God there with the thorns on his head, with the spear in his side, with his back. There's not even skin left on his back. They've jerked the beard out of his face, spit in his face, and you can barely tell, as it says in the book of Isaiah, that it's a man. It looks sort of like a man. But it's so bloodied and marred, it's beyond human semblance. But go walk around then with me to the back side of the cross, and what do you see there? There's another body, as some preachers have said. And who is it? Marred to death, barely looking like a human. My friends, it's you. It's you. I have been crucified with Christ. And this is the verse that has been so heavy on me recently. I've asked myself the question, how in the world can I beat such powerful temptation in my life? How can any Christian? And the answer is, is when you look to the cross, you're supposed to see yourself there as well. Your old man. With all his sin and with all his unbelief, hanging there, dead on the tree. I have been crucified with Christ, myself, my gossip, my lust, my pride, my frustration, my greed, my materialism, my anxiety, my disobedience, my timidity in speaking the gospel, my sin, my old man is hanging there on that tree dead. So much of the Christian life overcoming sin is God taking what happened on the cross and working that death into your life. Death to that old man. You see, that's why you can't beat sin by making a new habit. 
You've got to kill it. And the only way to do that is by looking by faith and seeing that God's already done it for you. You see, you see how powerful that is? That's world's difference of, of sinning and then going back to your room and beating yourself to death with guilt and groveling about and trying to figure out a way to do this Christian life on your own steam. When you sin, you go back to the cross and say, there it is, crucified, paid for, and the habit that made me do that has already been dealt the mortal womb. I have been crucified with Christ. We should run to the cross it's not gospel and, it's gospel only. Romans chapter 7 uses this wonderful marriage analogy. We, uh, Drake read this just a little bit earlier. And he uses this idea of marriage. And he says, Paul says, I want you to know something. It's like marriage. When two people get married, they're supposed to be married for till death do us part. You hear this line in, in weddings, till death do us part. Yes? Okay. Now, that line is not just some kind of line we made up, okay? Till death do us part is a line that is biblical because Paul and all the other writers of the Bible understood that, they, that death, or sorry, death, um, marriage was until death. So if two people get married and one of the people, one of the persons involved dies, the other person is, in the words of Paul, released from the law of marriage, Okay, so therefore, two married, one dies, they no longer have to be committed to that person anymore for the rest of their life because they're dead. They are free then to go and marry someone else. Okay, now why would Paul talk about that in Romans chapter 7? Why talk about marriage and the death of one and then being released from the law of marriage? Because Paul understands until that person dies, that law is in effect. You are committed to that person until death do you part. Now, he goes on to say, Likewise, my brothers, you have died to the law through the body of Christ. When Jesus died on the cross... He paid for our sin. He paid for our guilt. But he perfectly fulfilled the law. And we no longer need the law for righteousness. Because Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. That's exactly what it says in Romans chapter 9 around chapter 10. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. And that law comes in and says this, do this and then live. If you do this, then you will live. And Paul's trying to communicate to his hearers, you're dead to that. Because you died with Christ. You are dead to the phrase, do this and live. I will not do this and live. I will trust in him and live. You don't need gospel and you need gospel only. This is the power of sanctification in our lives. This is world's difference than the story I told you at the beginning of the sermon. Legalism and antinomianism. That's assuming we're playing on the same field. I'm dead to the law. My old man is dead. I have been crucified with Christ. How can I beat my gossip? I look to the cross and see that gossiping old man dead. How can I beat my anxiety and my lust or whatever it may be? You can look to the cross and see it there dripping with blood and drowning under the wrath of God. By faith. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. That's the power of sanctification in your life. 
Martin Luther, commenting on this book, says this, By faith in Christ, a person may gain such sure and sound comfort that he need not fear the devil or sin or death or any evil. He may say, Sir devil, I am not afraid of you. I have a friend whose name is Jesus Christ in whom I believe. He has abolished the law. He has condemned sin. He has vanquished death. And he has destroyed hell for me. He is bigger than you, Satan. He has licked you and hold you down. You cannot hurt me. This is the faith that overcomes the devil. The devil throws our sins in our face and we say, I have been crucified with Christ. But it doesn't stop there. The second point is the power of obedience is also found by faith in the gospel. Because he says, I've been crucified with Christ. Yet it is no longer I who live but Christ who lives in me. What freedom is found in those words? It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. There's such freedom when you're trying to do a project or you're trying to figure something out, you're trying to fix something, and it just keeps breaking. Right? And someone else comes along, the expert, so to speak, and just takes over the whole thing for you and does it perfectly and it's done similarly here we have ourselves we're out of the way in the picture I have been crucified with Christ and yet I live but it's not me who live it's Christ who lives within me he's doing his work Luther again explains he says true Christian righteousness True Christian righteousness is the righteousness of Christ who lives in us. See, there's no room for boasting here. We're not even the ones who do the work. It's Christ in us that does it. Luther says, think what grace, what righteousness and life and peace and salvation there is in me. Thanks to the inseparable conjunction between Christ and me through faith. Referencing back to Romans chapter 7, he says, You died to the law through the body of Christ so that you might live to another, to him who has been raised from the dead. Marriage analogy again. If one member dies, you no longer have to be married to that person. You're not married to that person. You're released from that law of marriage. And so we're allowed to be married to someone else. And Paul says it's just like that in the Christian life. At one point, you were married to do this and live, but now you're married to one who has beaten death itself and your sin and the law, and you have perfect freedom with him. That's beautiful. We need to go through Romans soon. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Someone else doing the work. This is not gospel and. This is gospel only. Galatians chapter 5 verse 1 says, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm therefore and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. These Galatians were so tempted as we are. Aren't we? We want something tangible. We want something physical or real that we can look at so that we can say, see, I'm doing it. I'm living the Christian life. It's real. And I'm, I'm beating this sin. And we can point to it and we can say, I get, I get a little skin in the game. I've got my 0.1%. But the gospel says this. Paul says, listen, if you're relying on your own works, Christ will be of no avail to you. No avail. It is not 99% Jesus and 1% you. That 1% will send you right to hell. It's 100% Christ from first to last. It's faith from first to last. It's not I who live. It's Christ who lives within me. All the credit for all the works. Crowns go to his feet. He did it. He does it. That's freedom. The Galatians were tempted, just like we are, to think that we start the Christian life by the Spirit and then we're perfected by the flesh. Look with me very quickly at Galatians uh, chapter 3, verse 5. This is a fantastic verse. I want you to grasp this in your walk. Galatians chapter 3, 
verse 5. This is often overlooked. It's such a small verse, and, and quite honestly, it was the last couple of few years where I became aware of it. It says this. Paul's speaking to the Galatians now, right? Who are being tempted to add circumcision to the gospel so that they can feel that they're right with God. He says, are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Or I'll back up even further to kind of give a little bit more context. If you start in verse 1, he says, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Here it is. Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supply the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Paul's saying, are you, are you so stupid and foolish that you started with hearing with faith and you received the Holy Spirit and you now think that your flesh is going to come in and make you better? No! You hear the gospel with faith at the beginning and never stop for the rest of your life. That is why I'm constantly trying to preach the gospel from this pulpit. Because you will not be sanctified without it. Unless that death of Christ is constantly worked into your life. That death to gossip. That death to lust. That death to anxiety. That death to materialism. And that life to righteousness. Because... He is my living head and I've been raised with him. Are you so foolish having begun by the Spirit? Are you now being perfected by the flesh? Does he who supply the Spirit to you, and then he says, and work miracles among you, do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? And aren't we tempted to think, oh, if I'm really, if I'm really obedient this week, Right? God's Spirit is going to be more likely to do some mighty works in my life. Well, you think that's going to earn you credit to get more attention from God's Spirit because you've done some extra stuff? He who supplies the Spirit to you supplies it by hearing with faith, not by works of the law. So, where are you? Are you working hard or believing hard? When you sin, do you try to make amends like Judas? Or do you run to Christ like Peter? Think about those two things for a moment. Remember what Judas did? He tried to take it back. He took the silver, threw it back at him, said, I've betrayed innocent blood. It looks noble, doesn't it? Do you ever think about that? He tried to undo it. Peter, what did he do? He denied that he knew Christ three times. And then when he saw him, he jumped out into the water like a trout and began to swim over to the shore, make a fool of himself, and he ran straight to Christ. That's the only thing you can do. And when you sin, do you try to make amends or do you trust Christ? Blessings in the Christian life I mean, blessings and curses, okay? Are you with me? The blessings and curses that were mentioned in the Old Testament. When God blesses you covenantally, it's not because of your obedience. It's because of Christ's obedience. That is why Paul can say at the beginning of Ephesians, we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And we will never be touched by any of the covenantal curses. Christ became a curse for us on that tree. 
You think of that bold statement. We think of the blessings and curses of the Old Testament. If you do this, I will bless you. If you don't do this, I will curse you. Praise God we're not under that covenant. Because Jesus has secured every spiritual blessing for me by his perfect obedience. And I'm resting in him. I'll never experience a single curse, covenantal curse that comes from God. I'm not talking about discipline for sin. Make no mistake, if you sin and you're God's child, he'll spank you. This is not what we're talking about here. We're talking about what the gospel does in our lives and how it brings blessing. We're talking about the power of sanctification. And the important point that I want to impress upon you is this, brothers and sisters, that death and life are at work in the Christian. Death to the old man and life resurrection life in our new man in Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. No more phrases do this and live. I already live. I'm already alive because Christ is alive within me. And you may be thinking, God has may have placed upon your heart, I know he has mine, a particular area where you want, he wants you to be obedient. And it's tough. It's hard. Actually, if you do it, it'll hurt. It may be witnessing to a family member. It may be giving to a mission that the church supports or something. It may be simply committing to come to meetings more. It may just be difficult obedience. You may be thinking, how am I going to be able to obey in that way? If you look at yourself, If you consider yourself dead to sin and Christ living in you, he will do that obedience. He will do that work through you. That will give you the power to obey. Last point, the normal Christian life is one of faith from first to last. For the righteousness of God is revealed from heaven, Paul says in the book of Romans, And it says, from faith, for faith. It also can be translated beginning and ending with faith. Or from faith from first to last. He says in 21, or actually it's at the end of uh, 20. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Brothers and sisters, I do not want you to nullify the grace of God by thinking that our faith walk started with faith at the beginning and continues going with our own strength and our own works. I especially don't want you to think that your relationship with God is dependent upon whether or not you live with God is dependent upon your obedience. It's dependent upon Christ entirely. And our faith should be found entirely in him. What is your work then? Well, Jesus answered that question for us. He says, this is the work of God. That you believe in the one whom he has sent. That you trust in him. Well, I don't feel like I have that repentance in my life. Trust God to give it to you. I feel like I can't repent of that sin because it's so powerful. It's so alive and active in my life. Look to the cross again and feel the spear in your own side. It has received a mortal wound. Your old man has been punctured to death. And ask God to work that death in your life. It's so hard to obey It's so hard to witness to my family members. Christ witnessed through me. These things are played out practically. We ought to be people staring at the cross. Staring up at Christ. An image came to my mind as I was kind of preparing this sermon. Can you imagine walking down the streets of New York? busy streets. Well, it used to be. I don't know about the coronavirus now, but it, it, you know, it is what it is. Let's just pretend pre-coronavirus walking down the streets of New York. Can you imagine someone just standing and looking up? 
And let's just pretend he's looking at the cross. There. He's looking at Christ. He's looking at the gospel. He's just staring and lost in wonder. What will people do? They're going to look with him. What's that guy looking at? Just stand. And you would expect people to say, Wow. And join you. Right? Some people will look and they'll scoff and walk away. That's okay. They're going to hell because of their unbelief. But maybe, maybe they'll come back and look. And maybe they'll be saved. You say, well, they can't just stand there and stare all day. Okay, well, let's not press the metaphor, church, okay? You see the point. Our life is staring off at something other than ourself. It's looking to Christ. And we hope that other people will come alongside us and look as well and be captured by his beauty and so be saved. Not all will. Some might try to distract you. Some might try to get your attention drawn away from what you're looking at. And you might even have to fight to keep looking. They might break you down and tear you down. But we will look until he appears in the clouds. You sin, church, stare at the cross. Are you sad? Stare. Do you feel indwelling sin? Stare again until you feel the spear go deep into your old man's side. That is your work, for this is the work of God that you believe in the one he has sent. Until you can say this with Paul, I am crucified. I'm sorry, excuse me. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives within me. And this brings me to the close of the sermon. You'll notice that I've printed a few things for you. Specifically, one is a hymn, a very long hymn. It's actually the full version of O oh, Four Thousand Tongues to Sing. Charles Wesley would be probably a little upset with us simply because we didn't sing the whole version. He kind of made a commandment. He says, if you're going to sing my hymns in church, you better sing it exactly the way I wrote it and the whole thing. And we didn't do that. So I went ahead to, in honor of him. <laughs> to, I printed the whole thing out. But it's so wonderful. It captures what we've been talking about this morning. It lifts up our hearts. Let it be a devotion for you later on today in your, in your Lord's Day as you go home and you celebrate. Take a look at this hymn. It's fantastic. And we're going to come and sing together an appropriate song for closing, Yet Not I. And I believe it goes so well along with this text. Church, I specifically want you to, particularly want you to focus on this. We are going through the rest of the minor prophets. And you are going, like myself, I'm going to be convicted over sin. And we may be tempted to say, how am I going to get this out of my life? Let me do this on my own work. Or let me try to do this so that I can get right with God. I want you to understand, in the new covenant, if your faith is in Christ, you are right with God already. We're not working for that. And if you need to overcome any sin, it's by the power of the gospel. Because the Lord, when he speaks to his people in these minor prophets, he is very frank. And he wants his people's hearts. And I also want you to listen and respond, but to respond by faith. They pursued the law, as it says in the book of Romans, as though it were based on works and not by faith. I certainly don't want that for us. If your faith is not in Christ, <clears throat> then I would say join those who are here who are looking to the gospel. Those who are standing on the street and are staring up at Christ until he returns. Repent of your sins and believe in him. If you are saved, keep doing that until kingdom come. If you would like to talk to me after the service, I'd be glad to talk to you. Um, if not, then... We will have our, uh, we will pray. We will have our song. The song will be playing as we partake of communion together. And if you are a believer in good standing with the evangelical church, if you're a member here, please come forward and, and partake of communion 
with us, and then we'll have our benediction after. If I could have the um, the ushers or deacons come up to the front couple of rows, just as a reminder.